American. Tomorrow is the 4th of July. Actually, technically, it's just July 4th. But in the States, we say the 4th of July. It's Independence Day in America tomorrow. And that means fireworks, hot dogs, hamburgers, picnics, all of that. Um, this is the first time in my life that I will not be in the United States of America for the 4th of July. Um, in fact, this is my first Sunday ever in Budapest in July. Uh, my wife and I come from the States. We moved here in August of 2012, but we are teachers, so we have the wonderful privilege of summers off. And so every summer, we take some time and we go back to the States and we visit our family and our friends. Um, and so typically, we spend the whole month of July and a little bit of August in the U.S. This year is different because my wife's having a baby, and the baby's due August 1st, so... Yeah, I get to be a daddy pretty soon. So that's kind of cool. Um, but where was I going with all of that? Forgive me. Forgive me if I ever lose my train of thought today. I don't do this too often, but I do teach for a living, so I'm used to being in front of people. Just most of the people I'm used to being in front of are a little bit younger. I teach guys like, like you, 14 to 19-year-old high school students. I teach them English. That's why we came to Budapest in the first place, if I didn't say that originally. My wife came, my wife and I came here to be English teachers in a Hungarian high school, hopefully um, imparting a skill that will bring value to their lives and maybe give them an opportunity for um, a better job, whether it's here or abroad, whatever they would desire um, in their lives. Um, so I do come from the United States of America, specifically Pennsylvania near to Philadelphia, but we have this like running joke that I'm from, well, it's close to Philly. Because um, all the towns outside Philadelphia generally kind of converge and make this really big suburban metropolis. Um, but there's so many little tiny towns that most people outside of the region have never heard of those towns. They just know that it's close to Philly. Philadelphia, uh, in connection with the 4th of July, was the kind of the, um, the leading city in the American Revolution. A lot of the leaders of early America met in Philadelphia as the 4th of July and uh, the American Revolution was, um, was coming to fruition. Uh, little known fact, maybe outside of the United States, is that the 4th of July is only celebrated on the 4th because that's when it was actually printed in the newspapers that, this, that these events were happening. It actually happened um, in the weeks the weeks ending the month of June and into early July, I think technically July 2nd is when the document was signed uh, declaring independence from um, the UK. But July 4th is when we celebrate it because that is when the papers printed the story. Um, history lesson is over. Now on to what we're going to be talking about today. Forgiveness. I didn't really want to talk about this, but my wife encouraged me to, as did God. And mostly because, um, for me, since I'm not a biblical scholar, the best way that I have learned to, um, to understand who God is and who I'm supposed to be as a Christian is to spend time getting to know God through Scripture, through prayer, through understanding His Word. But because I'm not a biblical scholar, I often seek out other texts, other books, to help me understand the Bible better. There's a guy by the name of Miroslav Volf who wrote this fantastic book called Free of Charge. It's about giving and forgiving. And since I was recently reading this book, and when I was thinking about what to talk about, my wife said, you might as well talk about what you've been learning through that book. And I said, okay. So let's do that. Um, forgiveness is not a easy topic to talk about sometimes. Thankfully, I have two weeks to do it, so we're going to start today, and we're going to continue next Sunday. Um, but I first want to tell you a little story, um, something that happened a couple of months ago in the U.S. I don't know, maybe it was, it was big news here. I'm not really sure how much it carried across the ocean into this continent, but I think it was in Cincinnati. There was a zoo a couple of months ago. A kid, by about the age of four, fell into this gorilla pit. How many people heard this story? Okay, that's good. Say so, so a kid, four years old, falls into a gorilla pit. What does this have to do with forgiveness? Well, we'll get there. Okay. So, 
the mom and other patrons of the zoo, when they notice this kid is in the pit, they start freaking out. And they're like screaming at the gorilla because the gorilla, this huge gorilla, is just hovering right over the kid. I mean, that's got to be scary, right? But the kid was just sitting there. The kid looks calm. How many people saw the video, right? So all the people are screaming at this gorilla, and all of a sudden, the gorilla starts to get riled. The gorilla is nervous. The gorilla grabs the kid and drags it through the water. So people are freaking out even more. The people at the zoo have to make a decision quickly. What do we do? They thought, well, we could tranquilize the gorilla, but, well, the tranquilizer... The medicine inside of it takes time to have its effect, and in that time, if the gorilla is already riled, it could get even more riled and possibly endanger the kid even more than what the kid is already, uh, the danger the kid is already in. in. So they decide, we gotta kill it. We gotta kill this gorilla. So they get out the weapon, one shot, boom, kid is saved, minus a few bumps, scratches, bruises, the kid is okay. Maybe a little traumatized by the experience, but the kid is okay, the gorilla is dead. Of course, this caused a huge uproar. We just killed an innocent animal. An innocent animal, animal, a beautiful creature that God created. And we killed him because a kid was in harm's way. Well, what if the story was different? What if the gorilla actually ended up killing the kid. What if they didn't get to the gun in time or they didn't get to the tranquilizer in time? What if the gorilla, in its nervousness and not understanding all these screams that were taking place around it, what if the gorilla had killed the kid? Well, then we'd have a different story to talk about. We would have to talk about, do we actually now need to kill the gorilla because it killed a human? Or do we need to send the gorilla off to another zoo somewhere else in the world so that this zoo isn't stained with this, this death on its hands. And then what happens between the family of the child that would have died and the gorilla? Do we need to have a sit-down and a talk about forgiveness? Well, maybe it sounds like a silly question, but the reason why we have to have this question in the first place is understand that forgiveness is something that takes place between humans, right? There's no wrong action that we can impute upon an animal against humans that we could, um, that would cause us to need to have a forgiveness in that relationship, okay? Um, forgiveness takes place between humans. Forgiveness takes place... Um, no matter what level of relationship you have with someone, but the closer you get to a person, the easier it is to offend and the more necessary forgiveness becomes. Recently, there were these attacks carried out in Istanbul at the airport. So, of course, now all the people who lost a loved one have to grapple with forgiving those who did this act. They did not know these people who committed these murders. They did not know these people who walked in there and decided they were going to cause harm and chaos and death. But they have to grapple with the fact of forgiveness. Now that seems like a much bigger wrongful action to deal with than perhaps the everyday arguments that we might encounter with each other. For example, my wife and I, by virtue of being married, we will argue, and we do argue. And when we get into these situations where we argue, of course, since I really feel confidently that I am right most of the time, I will do everything in my power, including use words that hurt to to make my point in the situation. And because I use words that hurt, I then have to come back and say, you know what, I was wrong. As much as it hurts me to say, I was wrong, I sinned, I hurt you, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And it's her job and responsibility to offer forgiveness. So, um, 
Before we get into the rest of what I'm going to say, I would like to just say a brief word of prayer so that the words that come out of my mouth hopefully are that which God would intend for you to hear. Okay? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that you have given me to to be here this morning, Lord, and to share from your scripture and to share from your heart. Lord, I pray that of all the words that come out of my mouth, those would um, those that do come out would be from your spirit, Lord, and that they would bring life and edification to this body, Lord, and that you would use it, Lord, for your glory and not for anything that would benefit me, but that only that which would benefit you in this body. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so to talk about forgiveness, there's a parable from the Bible I would like us to look at. If you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Uh, We're going to start in verse 21. So, some of your Bibles might say that this is the parable of the unmerciful servant. Some of your Bibles might say this is the parable of the unforgiving servant. And we'll see that mercy and forgiveness are both kind of intertwined into the story. So Peter comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. And some of your uh, translations might also say seventy times seven. Um, Therefore, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, please have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a 100 denarii. And he seized him and he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But the first servant refused. And he went and put his fellow servant in prison until he should pay the debt. When other servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned the first servant and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So one thing that I like to do when examining Scripture is to ask a few questions. Because I think questions, when we have specific questions in mind, uh, they help us to kind of seek out the answers that maybe God is trying to reveal to us through the text. So as I read through this passage, a few questions that I came up with um, were, how do mercy and justice kind of fit into this picture of forgiveness? How do mercy and justice help us to understand forgiveness better? And the second question I kind of came up with was, is God's forgiveness toward us actually conditional, as the last verse might suggest? Um, So today we're going to talk about the first question, and next week we will deal with the second one, as well as maybe a few others that come out of it. First of all, the thing that we should remember at the start of this story is that the story that we read is a parable. Now, parables, by and large, are fictional accounts. They are, you know, the the characters in them are not real. The details are made up. They were created. But parables laid alongside of a truth show us the parallel realities in the two of them. Okay? So God, Jesus, used parables to um, reveal God's truth to people as he, would, um, as he would talk to them. 
Now, the master in this parable is God. And the servants that we see represent us, mankind. Okay, we all owe God a massive debt, one that we cannot repay. And if, if you would do some research on this parable, the, the amount of money that the first servant owes to the master is, um, has been calculated to be something like two years' wages. It's a massive amount. How many of us, if we owed two years' wages to someone, would be eternally grateful to them if they forgave us of that debt? And then the amount that the servant who was forgiven is owed by another servant is like maybe a day's wage, if that. It's not much at all. And so to see where one servant is forgiven and then forgiven a lot and then cannot forgive a little... Now you understand maybe why it causes such anger to rise up in the master when he hears of it. But by virtue of the fact that we are all sinners, we owe God this massive debt, one that we cannot pay, but God forgives us. Now there are a few key components that cause forgiveness to be necessary. The first key component is that there is a wrongdoer which at some point in time has been and is all of us. We are all wrongdoers. Um, The second key component is there is the person who is wronged, which again is each and every one of us. We have all been wronged by someone else at some point in time or another. And the third key component is the wrongful action, which is not us, right? The action that takes place, even though we commit the action, the action... Forgiveness seeks to separate the action from the doer. So in the parable that we just read, the debt or the lack of paying the debt is the wrongful action from the servant against the master. And the master, rather than serve justice, which would be to sell the servant and his family and all that he owns to pay for the debt, he chooses to be merciful. Now, he could have just been merciful and let the man, let the servant go home and still said said to him, you know, you owe me this debt. But what we see is that the master chooses to actually forgive the debt entirely, initially. Um, When we think about our relationship to God, Uh, As I said, by virtue of the fact that we are all sinners, if God were a just God, which he is, we would all be condemned to die, which we are. And that's why Jesus has to come into the picture. Romans 6.23 says that for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, justice as God would have it, would seek to condemn the fault and then because of the fault, condemn the doer as well, which is what we see in the parable. The fault of owing a debt and not being able to pay it now condemns the doer of the fault. He should be sold. However, to forgive is to condemn the fault but then to spare the doer. So the master, when he forgives the servant of this debt, he never says to him that it was okay what he did. He never says that. But he spares him his rightful punishment and allows him to go home freely to be with his family. The key in looking at forgiveness is that we must view it as a gift, a gift from God. As unnatural as forgiveness can feel and as uncomfortable as it can be, forgiveness is a gift. Um, Gifts, we should remember, are given for the benefit of another, not for the benefit of the giver, although we may truly benefit from the gift ourselves. the purpose of giving a gift in general is to benefit another person. I think 
marriage is a good, a good um, way to look at gift giving sometimes. Uh, the first few years of marriage are often a trial run on a lot of things. You're learning about each other. You're learning likes and dislikes, what makes someone comfortable, uncomfortable, all those kinds of things. I remember my very first Christmas being married to Erin. Probably half the gifts I bought her, she returned. Because I still didn't know her yet. Okay? And so those gifts, they were for her benefit. They were things that I thought she wanted or needed. They were things that I thought would help her or be good for her. Right? I messed up a little bit. Maybe I didn't understand her totally. I didn't get the right things. Right? And so there was no benefit for me in giving the wrong gift. Maybe a benefit in giving a good gift or the right gift would have been the joy that I would have in seeing her satisfied. Yet, the reality is that the gift that we give is for the benefit of another person, not for the benefit of ourselves. Now, the difference with forgiveness being a gift as compared to other gifts that we might give is that generally we give gifts when we are pleased or delighted with someone. For a birthday, for Christmas... When I was a kid growing up, if I had good marks in school, if I had straight A's, my dad gave me some extra pocket money. That was my reward for doing a job well done. That was my gift for being a good student. My dad was pleased that I had all fives or all A's in the States. Okay? But forgiveness is not a gift that we give when we are delighted or pleased with someone. Forgiveness is a gift that we give when we have been wronged by someone. Like I said, there's the wrongdoer, there's the person wronged, and there's the wrongful action. Now, in the story that we read, the master is certainly not pleased or delighted in his servant. But he chooses to be merciful. He chooses to be forgiving. He releases the servant, from the punishment due him, and then he forgives him of the burden of this massive debt. Now, if you think about it, if you were the servant in this situation and you knew that you owed someone this large an amount of money, I'm sure it was probably causing a little bit of stress in other areas of your life. Thinking about how much you had to collect somehow, whether working for it or doing other various activities, maybe some under-the-table scheming to try and collect the debt that you owed. It was probably not creating a good environment in his home with his wife, with his kids. Um, And yet, he didn't run from it. He went went to the master because he knew that he was guilty. And then he implored. He implored from the master, and the master was gracious and merciful. Now, mercy... Um, mercy, as I said, would be releasing the servant from the punishment that he was rightfully due. Okay, But forgiveness was releasing him from the debt completely. And this is what God has done for us through the person of Jesus. Right? Um, if we look back in Romans chapter 5, um, Paul talks to us about how Through one man, Adam, sin entered the whole world. So by virtue of what Adam did, now we are all claimed as sinners. But through the person of Jesus Christ, now we can all be claimed as righteous in God's sight. Yet another aspect to this gift of forgiveness is not just the fact of giving it, but the fact of receiving it as well. Now, when you give a gift to someone, let's say, for example, that I sent you a gift to your home through the mail. Okay? When the mail comes and delivers it, technically, you have received that gift. But truly, you haven't received it until you open it, see it, understand it, 
and choose to keep it and to accept it. It's the same way with God's forgiveness towards us and it's the same way with our forgiveness towards one another. Now earlier I said that forgiveness names the it names the wrongful act and it condemns it. To be the giver of forgiveness is to claim that an offender has offended us. To be the giver of forgiveness is to acknowledge that you will not hold that offense against the offender. To be the receiver of forgiveness is to accept both the accusation and the release. So when we think back to this parable, if the first servant had truly received his forgiveness from the master, he probably wouldn't have gone and held his fellow servant accountable for the small amount that he was owed to the first servant. Now, the passage doesn't specifically tell us, but I think it's safe to assume as we read this scripture and as we look on the words of Jesus telling this story, that perhaps the first offender, this first servant, didn't feel that he was an offender after all and therefore was not in need of receiving forgiveness. And because he felt maybe that he was not in need of receiving forgiveness, to give forgiveness was a difficult task for him. Now, as I was doing some research on this topic and um, thinking about some different examples that I could use, I found a cool little diagram. Rather than trying to create my own and spending the time doing that, I thought if I can find something on the Internet just by Googling, you know, maybe I could use something that someone else had already created that would serve the same purpose that I was seeking for it to serve. Well, this is what I found, and actually it's not exactly what I had in mind, but I thought it still works. Here, um, this is kind of a diagram of the attributes of God. And at the center, we see love. And as a lot of people in the world like to remind Christians, um, they, you know, I don't know if you've ever encountered this before, but um, when, when you meet someone who has like a bad idea of what a Christian is because they've only attached all the bad things they've seen or heard in the world that Christians have done to all Christians, um, they say, isn't your God a loving God? Why aren't you as loving? Right? And it's true. Love is at the center of who God is. And love should be at the center of who we are in this world. And when we look at the other attributes of God that are around this circle of love, we see just, merciful, gracious, slow to anger, loving kindness, faithful, and forgiving. But I, I think forgiving shouldn't be out there and forgiving should be in the center where love is as well. I think for us to understand forgiveness as God intends it, we have to view it not as a secondary trait of who God is, not as an extension of God's love, but as a natural part of who God is to begin with. I want to read a quote for you from this book that I mentioned I've been reading. For those who don't know who Miroslav Volf is, uh, he's a Henry B. Wright Professor of Theology at Yale Divinity School and Director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. He was born in former Yugoslavia. He's Croatian, uh, emigrated to the States, and is one of the most highly recognized theologians of today. His books are good. If you've ever read one from him, you would know. If you haven't, I would suggest that you do. He opens up the scriptures in ways that probably a enrollment at theology school would do for, for most of us. So if you want to save a little bit of money, buy a Miroslav Wolf book and read it. So the reason why I would say that I think forgiveness is at the center with love, um, in his book on called Free of Charge, um, Miroslav Wolf says, in view of the fact that before creating the world, God knew that humans would sin. 
God who gives by creating was from the very start also the God who forgives. The same love that propelled God to create by giving propelled God to mend by forgiving. So essentially what he's saying is that God, knowing what sin would do and cause to his creation, still chose to create anyway because he's a forgiving and a loving God. And forgiveness is at the core of his being. How is mercy different than forgiveness? If we go to the next slide... I think it's best summed up by saying that mercy is an attribute of God, whereas forgiveness is part of God's essence. Think about a tree. There are lots of branches on a tree. All the branches are connected to the trunk. The trunk is the core. The trunk is the heart. Without a trunk, you don't have branches. Without forgiveness, we don't have mercy. Without forgiveness, we don't have justice. In fact, if there was no forgiveness, there would literally be no point to our existence because the justice that we rightfully deserve is to simply live and die. But because of Jesus, because of forgiveness, we have the hope, we have the confidence that there is something better, that there is a reason to live, that there is a reason to know God to understand him better, to serve him. Um, I think forgiveness is what puts mercy and justice into into play. You know, there are many situations we can talk about. You know, the Istanbul attacks. Um, another story from the States recently that caused a lot of commotion was an athlete from the University of Stanford who was accused of assaulting a woman. And this athlete, if you don't know the story, so Stanford is a very prestigious university in California. And this athlete, you know, comes from a fairly well-off, white, middle-class, upper-middle-class family. So he is as privileged as you can be in American society today, And he assaulted a woman, and the judge gave him what many considered to be a very, very merciful and lenient um, discipline. And that story caused a lot of a lot of commotion, because at the heart of each and every one of us, we desire to see justice served. We want people to pay for what they've done. Mercy is not easy to give. Forgiveness is even harder. As I said at the beginning, the closer we get to someone in relationship, the easier it is to offend. But also, the more difficult it is to maybe forgive yourself for things that you've done to that person. In the story that we read, the master who forgives a lot, I'm sure was very upset when he heard that his servant could not be equally forgiving. And so he called him back and said, you servant of mine, how could you? I forgave you so much. And you cannot forgive this little amount? I think when we think about mercy and justice as compared to forgiveness, um, mercy is much more of a personal Um, decision that we have to make. Whereas for those of us in Christ, forgiveness is not so much a decision as much as it is um, a change of our heart. God, God doesn't require us 
to be merciful, but he requires us to be forgiving. When we take a look at mercy, I think it's best viewed in connection with the law and our own set of morals and ethics. When I think about growing up in a Christian home, you know, my parents felt that discipline was a necessary and right thing to do. And I was spanked as a child. How many people were spanked? If you don't mind, raise your hand. Spanking did me a little bit of good, right? Um, But I can remember one time in particular, maybe my dad was reading up about mercy and forgiveness at this time, I don't know. But one time in particular, I was probably eight or nine years old, and I don't even remember what I did, but my dad was in tears. It was me and my older brother. We were both in the wrong. We both did something. I don't remember exactly what. And my dad handed us the spoon, and he said, spank me instead. I will take your punishment. And it was his way to demonstrate Christ to us. He showed us mercy in that situation. But that only happened once. Every other time I got the spanking. So, Most of the time my dad was not merciful, but he served justice when justice needed to be served. Mercy, I think, is viewed as, best viewed as an act of compassion. It is exclusive and subjective. Even we learn, the more that we learn about God, we see that God, God will serve justice to whom God feels justice needs to be served, and God will be merciful to whom God wants to be merciful. Right? There are times when we wish God would be just, and He isn't, and there are times when we wish God would be merciful. And he isn't. But God is always forgiving. Forgiveness, because it's a part of God's DNA, it's a part of who God is, forgiveness is an act of reconciliation, it is inclusive, and it is objective. Forgiveness is always there. It's a gift readily available for you to be, for you to receive. And when viewed in our relationship with Christ, I think it's safe to say that forgiveness is supposed to be part of our core as well and not a secondary attribute, not an extension of our relationship with Christ, but a natural part of who we are as little Christ in the world. When we look at the parable again, the servant owed his master a great debt by law, he would have been required to pay back what he, what he had borrowed, and he could not. The master had every right to demand justice for being wronged. God has every right to demand justice of us, but he does not. He sent his son Jesus so that we could have the most perfect example of forgiveness possible, When someone wrongs us, we can choose to seek justice or we can choose to be merciful. Um, If we're merciful, we do not give the wrongdoer what they deserve. But I think what God wants from us is to offer forgiveness, to separate the wrongdoer from the wrong action, not to pretend that the action didn't take place because that would be a different topic for a different day. But to recognize that there is a difference between the action and the person. We condemn the action. We don't condemn the person. We save the relationship rather than creating more damage. So, That's the first part. I hope we maybe have a little bit of a better understanding of mercy and its connection to forgiveness. Next week will be, I think, a little bit more of a difficult task in looking at, is God's forgiveness toward us conditional? 
dun, 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 to be continued. All right, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your scripture, which gives us better understanding of who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your justice, but mostly we thank you for your forgiveness, which saves us from your mercy and your justice. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son Jesus to, to be the best example um, that we can learn from and live by. Lord, you are a good, good God. Above all, you are loving and you are forgiving and you wish for us to be loving and forgiving towards one another and this world. We pray, Lord, that as we go from here today, Lord, that you would just be with us and keep us mindful of you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.